I didn't realize that you worked there. Yes, I'm Save the Children International. Thomas Chandy, our chief executive of Save the Children India, is also here. Was, was Arun in the... Ladies and gentlemen... No, I don't think I saw him, no. Welcome. I saw him on Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to the closing plenary of the 28th uh, India Summit uh, run by the World Economic Forum. I'm uh, really pleased to have uh, the co-chairs of the meeting uh, here at the closing panel, but also um, our distinguished uh, guest, Montek Singh, Alovalia, the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission and one of uh, the leading and most respected economists uh, in India and also one of the brains behind the reforms in the 90s but also the reforms that we are seeing uh, now. But before I turn to uh, the panel and also a conversation with Mr. Alovalia, I'm also very pleased that uh, we have uh, the Chief uh, Minister of uh, the state of Haryana, Bhupinder Singh Huda, with us here today. He will then greet us uh, and, and send a message to all our distinguished uh, participants. So, uh, Chief Minister, the floor is yours. Please. Good afternoon, all of you. Dr. Montaik Singhji Aliwalia, Deputy Chairman, Planning Commission of India. Mr. Boge Brandy, Man Managing Director, and friends, delegates, ladies, and gentlemen. I hope that your stay in Gurgaon was comfortable and enjoyable. I am delighted to be here at the closing session of the World Economic Summit. In, on India. The v, VEF summits have always provided an occasion for leading economic thinkers, policy makers and professionals to come to together and reflect on major economic trends in India. I would like to compliment the World Economic Forum for the enthusiasm with which they have been organizing these annual summits. As we come to an end of the discussions, I am sure there would be some new ideas and takeaway resulting from three days of deliberations. As per the scheduled program, I was to participate in the discussion on United States of India. But since the program has been rescheduled, I have decided to attend the closing session of the summit. I would like to take the opportunity to apprise you of Haryana, the host state. Friends, only a few days back, <coughs> Haryana completed 46 years of its existence. During these years, the state has made an all-round development. Haryana accounts for a mere 1.3% of the total area of the country. Yet, it contributes nearly 3.4% to the national GDP. With per capita income of, of 2,000 US dollar during 2011-12, it occupies the top position amongst the major states of our country. From being primarily an agrarian state, it has grown into one of the most industrialized econ economies in the country, while services and industrial sectors continue to be its mainstay. The state continues to maintain its leading position in the agricultural sector. Haryana today has succeeded in harnessing the progressive thirst of industrialization by dint of innovative system and pragmatic strategies, thereby becoming a pioneering state in the modern India. The state of art, infrastructure, industry-friendly policies, responsive administration, peaceful law and order condition, and abundant skilled manpower make it a preferred destination in, for industrial investment. The Haryana growth story can be understood by the fact that an average annual growth rate of 9.4% has been recorded in the past seven years from 2005-06 to 2011-12. It is substantially higher than the national growth rate of 8.4%. As per the recent SOCM report of October 2011, 
2011, 87% of the total investment received in Haryana are from private sector, which is a clear indication of confidence that Haryana generates among the private investors. A report of September 2010 by the Association states that the Haryana achieved 81% implementation rate of pledged investments ahead of states like Gujarat, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, and Karnataka. As per the CMIE report of 2007, Haryana achieved the top position in terms of per capita uh, investment. As per India's today's state of state study report 2011, Haryana is ranked as the top state in most improved big states, health and education sector categories. The state has backed the Most Competitive State Award 2011 in the category of Most Innovation Driven Economies conferred by Institute of Competitiveness and Mint. Creation of infrastructure of international standard has been our constant endeavor. We are striving to improve connectivity, ensure quality power supply, water supply and water power effective logistic support uh, to industry. The KMP Expressway will facilitate seamless connectivity of Haryana. A global corridor has been planned along its 135 kilometers route, which offers new opportunities for development of theme-based activities. We have already brought metro to Gurgaon. Metro connectivity to Faridabad is under construction. Similarly, the metro connectivity to Bhadargarh has been approved. Rapid rail connection to Panipat is also on the anvil. Our other initiative include a cargo airport, upgradation of national and state highways, intercity connectivities, intracity transport, including rapid metro, etc. A number of infrastructure in initiatives have been planned under Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor project, which will throw up huge investment opportunities. The industrial infrastructure in the state is being strengthened through development of new industrial model townships and industrial estate and expansion of existing estates. Niche, niche parks such as the food parks, IT parks are being developed under the cluster development strategy. Breaking away from the traditional way of governance, we have adopted a model which facilitates hassle-free and time-bound time approvals. Our government has positioned itself in the role of a facilitator. The Industrial and Investment Policy 2011 of Haryana facilitates promotion of investment into the state. In order to provide a level playing field, we have simplified rules and procedures and fixed time timelines for clearances so as to improve efficiency and transparency by way of Haryana Industrial Promotion Act of 2005. The state has also emerged as an education hub and boasts of world-class infrastructure in sports too. The players of Haryana have brought laurels not only to the state but to the entire nation. It is a matter of pride that our players have begged four out of six medals won by India in London Olympics 2012. During the last seven years, there has been unprecedented expansion of education infrastructure. The number of technical institutions has increased from 161 to 640, and annual intake has gone from 28,445 to 1,42,226 during this period. We are also taking steps to create a sizable pool of technical and skilled manpower to take advantage of knowledge economy with setting up of institutes like IIM at Rohtak, IIC at Manesar, FDDI at Rohtak, CPET at Murthal, Defence University at Gurgaon, Central University at Mahendragad, Rajiv Gandhi Education City at Sonipat, Women's University also at Sonipat, and sanction of NIFT and uh, NED. National Institute for Design for Haryana, the state has emerged as an education hub. Only yesterday, the Union Agriculture and Food Processing Industries Ministry, Minister inaugurated the National Institute of Food and Technology, Entrepreneurship and Management at Kundli. 
This institute would go a long way in improving the capacity building and the skill enhancement in food processing sector. The private sector can avail of this opportunity by identifying niche areas where skill development initiatives are required and help devise the required curriculum to create the desired skill sets. In the health sector also, we have identified a number of focal areas and devised key strategies. Health services are being expanded and new medical colleges are being set up to achieve the goal of health for all. It is also our endeavor to involve the private sector in the development of medical infrastructure and facilities through public-private partnerships. Any vision for growth remains a mere pipe dream unless it is supported by good governance and political will. We have an excellent track record on law and order front with one of the lowest crime rates in the country. The workforce in Haryana is diligent and hard working. The number of man days lost on the industrial front in Haryana is one of the lowest in the country. Haryana was one of the first states to come out with a comprehensive and progressive labor policy. Friends, our government has always been responsive to the needs and aspirations of the farmers and land owners. It is with the, this key priority in view of in view that we notified our landmark rehabilitation and resettlement policy which eventually emerged as a role model. The policy provides for annuity to landowners for 33 years over and above the land compensation. Our recent innovation of land pooling scheme would further ensure the farmers and hard and landowner to get on not to get only maximum benefit but also get a fair share in the development projects. Haryana is one of the few states that have agreed to the FDI foreign direct investment in retail. We expect that the move will benefit the farmers, consumers and entrepreneurs apart from building up the rural infrastructure through cold chains, food processing centers and warehouses, etc. Friends, as you all know, we are passing through a global recessionary phase. The impact of information revolution has raised the expectation and aspirations of the people. It is important for the industry to have a connect with people in the areas they are located. Gone are the days when industry and business could afford islands of prosperity without showing much concern to the people around. It is here that I would like to stress that the industry should strive to make a difference to the lives of the people, much more to the people around you, by giving a meaningful and practical shape to the concept of co corporate social responsibility. Friends, it seems we are passing through a phase of difficult times of human history. On one hand, people are throwing off shackles on non-democratic regimes and opting for democracy as, as a preferred form of political order. On the other hand, liberal capitalism has emerged as a preferred ho form of economic order. While democratic institutions are gaining ground, doubts are being expressed about the sustainability of market-led economy orders. No doubt, this order leads to faster growth but also creates income disparities. We have to balance the two. How do we do that is tough challenge for us. All this is a part of evolution of humankind. What we need is a firm resolve among ourselves to generate the right kind of atmosphere, to harness the people's energy, to promote culture of positive thinking and constructive action. Equally important is the challenge of dealing with the prophets of doom. You represent an elite you, you represent an elite, elite and your credibility is quite high. I urge you to forge an intellectual alliance of right-minded people to fight the menace of negativity and cynicism. Let me end by thanking all of you for what has been a very useful exchange of views and ideas. We hope to continue benefiting from your knowledge, wisdom and experience. I wish you all the best 
in your efforts to contribute to the process of building India. I also thank for uh, I also thank you for coming to Gurgaon and wish you a safe journey home. I thank you all. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. So thank you so much uh, to Chief Minister Huda uh, from sharing with us also uh, the success uh, story of uh, Haryana. So uh, let's uh, turn uh, to the uh, panel and uh, to the Deputy uh, Chairman of the Planning Committee uh, of uh, India, Montek Singh uh, Aluvalia. Um, Looking uh, at the global economic uh, situation, we have been through uh, the worst crisis since the 1930s. Are we now seeing a, a light in the end of the uh, tunnel, or is this just uh, a, a train uh, coming uh, closer? <laughs> no, I think the <clears throat> there's no doubt that the global economic situation is uh, not very healthy. But, you know, I would say that it's probably better than it was uh, five months ago. Uh, two, uh, two changes since the last five months. One is I think that uh, what looked five months ago uh, like a high degree of uncertainty about whether European Eurozone policymakers would be willing to actually do what is necessary to make sure that the Euro survives. I mean, there was more doubt about that five months ago. I think there's much less doubt about that now. So I think there is a perception that the, the euro as a currency is not going to crack up. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about whether uh, the policies that individual European countries follow uh, are going to sort of end up leading to an early resumption of growth or lead to uh, a sort of pretty stagnant or anemic economic situation for several years. That still remains uncertain. But I think the, uh, the disappearance of the prospects of a currency collapse are a very important uh, change in the situation. And the other change is obviously the political change in the United States, uh, most important economy uh, in the world. Uh, and you have a, an election that has produced a mandate uh, for President Obama and a better outcome in the Senate. So my guess would be that uh, many of the uncertainties about the fiscal cliff, et cetera, which were worrying people, uh, I mean, they haven't disappeared, but I think the situation is a lot better uh, from both those points of view. Do you because there are a lot of problems that remain, and yeah. we're facing them ourselves too. Do you foresee any change in the economic policy in the second term of an Obama administration when it comes to economy, uh, trade policies, and etc. Well, it's difficult to predict. Uh, you should never predict policies based on whatever was said during an election campaign. So I think <laughs> the, the, the Americans have a very good tradition that uh, there's quite a period of time between now and the inauguration. So presumably, President Obama will give some sense of uh, what he wants to do, and we should wait for that. I do think in terms of global trade, uh, the US has an opportunity uh, to signal a process that would really get people seriously thinking about what are doable uh, compromises. I mean, the fact is that in Geneva, because, uh, none of the negotiators has seriously looked at issues because they're all waiting for the US election. Well, now the election's over, so let's see what happens. It is tough, I mean, because ideally we should be, uh, if this was a situation where uh, there was very robust economic growth or an early resumption around the corner, you'd get one sort of attitude towards trade. That's certainly not happening. But still, there is a, you know, there, there's a matter of leadership here uh, which will be tested. Because is the, is the global economy going to let the Doha round uh, simply fall by the wayside? That's the question. 
There is also a, a changing leadership uh, this week uh, in the second largest economy in the world uh, being China and the most populous uh, country in the world. Do you think this uh, will also have any impact on uh, uh, the willingness to uh, agree on additional uh, global uh, deals and compact when it comes to stimulating uh, the economy? Well, I, I, I hope that, you know, whenever you get a new leadership in place and if the process is seamless, uh, the new leadership is obviously going to give signals about what its future actions are. So you're right. I mean, the largest economy and the second largest economy uh, will, in this period, have put forward, will be entering into second administrations. But we need to wait and see uh, what signals emerge. I mean, I don't have a feel. Uh, for what, what would come out. So maybe we should then turn to the largest democracy uh, in the world, uh, being uh, India. And we have seen that uh, India uh, throughout years now have had quite an impressive economic growth, 8-9%. Uh, the last year uh, it's been more sluggish, coming down to 5.5%. In your view, how much of this more sluggish growth is caused by internal factors, and how much of this is a result of uh, the global economic um, sluggish growth. Yeah. Well, just one correction. L last year was not 5.5, it was 6.5. What, what you've got in the last two quarters, one of which was belonging to the last year and one of which is this year, is around 5.5. So the real issue is, uh, I think, somewhere uh, there's clearly been a lowering of uh, growth forecasts for India. Uh, we started the year thinking we're going to do something over seven, and it's been lowered since then. But on present prospects, uh, probably the first half will be around five and a half. My view is that I think there is some signals of a turnaround. Uh, it's uncertain how strong that turnaround can be. Uh, so in the second half, we'll do better than 5.5. But you know, some people think, well, we'll be lucky to reach six. I don't think it's too important to put a number to the current year. Uh, the really important thing is, is the economy turning around? I think it is, but it's too early to be confident. Uh, three months later, we'll have a much better idea. Now, your, your other, the main question was, is this entirely because of the global situation? No, I mean, that's not our view, and we have repeatedly said that. There's no doubt, by the way, that the global economic situation had an impact on India. I mean, our exports are doing pretty poorly. More than the impact uh, through exports is really the impact of uh, a decline in animal spirits everywhere. I mean, I think what happens in a, when the world economy is booming, uh, all kinds of uh, shortcomings uh, in every economy get ignored. Uh, when that doesn't happen, everyone uh, you know, shines a spotlight. So we've been shining a lot of spotlights ourselves, and a lot of people are shining a lot of spotlights on us. I don't think any of the problems that people uh, are worried about were not there two years ago or three years ago. It's just that when the economy was booming, everybody thought, well, this will somehow take care of itself. I think it will take care of itself. But, you know, one advantage of uh, recognizing that there are domestic uh, problems is that you get around to trying to solve them. And I think government uh, has given lots of signals about what it intends to do. I think the finance minister has made it very plain uh, that he thinks the fiscal deficit is too high, we need to bring it down. He's not going to bring it down in one year, to a, and that's not even reasonable. I think the current view globally is that you really ought to have a credible adjustment program. So he's got a program which will bring it down to, from whatever it was last year, close to 6%, comes down to <clears throat> 3% by the end of, by 2016. That's a, <coughs> a modest pace of reduction. Uh, we have lots of problems which we've uh, focused on, which relate to implementation of large projects. And I think those we're currently struggling with <coughs> to put in place mechanisms which would allow infrastructure projects to get the necessary clearances rapidly and transparently, you know, without, without uh, sacrificing the objective for which those clearances are there, you know, environmental, et cetera. But it has not worked as uh, seamlessly or smoothly as it should. And the government is currently focusing on that. There were many, 
many tax-related issues that came up in the last budget, and I think the government has said that they are going to actually fix those problems. Uh, various committees have been set up. Their recommendations are being looked at. Other reforms that were, you know, in the pipeline have moved forward uh, in the last three or four months. I think the government is clearly giving a signal that um, we know that a lot needs to be done domestically, and we've started doing it. I think we need to do more. Looking at the reforms, when do you think uh, you're going to see uh, the first positive impact on growth in China and uh, in India stemming from uh, the implementation of the reforms? Growth in India? Yeah. You know, uh, <clears throat> I, w I would guess that we should certainly see in the second half of the current year a better performance than in the first half. But you know, if 5.5 goes to 5.8, I mean, that's better, but it's not going to excite anybody. My feeling is that next year, next fiscal year, which begins on April 1, it's not impossible to target a growth rate of about 7% if we fixed all these problems between now and then. Uh, and of course, a lot depends on what happens to the global economic situation, which seems to be improving. So if you combine the effect of a lot of domestic corrections with the effect of a, a sort of greater, a greater stability and a more positive mood globally, I think we can see a revival of investment in India, which would actually take it up. You know, the dominant, uh, the dominant factor that will affect growth in India is the rise of investment. We are not counting on a huge increase in exports. Uh, we've never been an export-dependent economy in the same sense. But what we've seen in the last three years is a, maybe a three to four percentage points reduction in the rate of investment. That's what needs to be reversed. And the reforms can lead to that. But why, why, did it take, why didn't the reforms come two, three years ago already? But that's a very good question. I mean, <laughs> I suppose you... You know, any, I mean, it's not a secret. We are a coalition government. We are a highly participative, uh, you could even say fractionated uh, polity. And any government which wants to move forward has to try to get everybody on board. Sometimes you try for a little too long. On this occasion, it's clearly the case that the government did not they did not sort of hold back until they got everyone on board. They just decided that we've tried enough. Now let the people judge. And I think that's the right approach. You can't sit around waiting for a consensus because most of what we've done, there isn't a consensus, at least as far as it's publicly expressed by many of the opposition parties and even some of those that were supporting the government earlier. So this is a test. I mean, you know, will it work? You have to be willing to crush some eggs to make omelette. That's what you're saying. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me turn to uh, Mr. Uh, Paul uh, Balke, uh, CEO of one of the leading uh, and, uh, companies uh, in the world, uh, Nestle. Uh, listening uh, to the Indian uh, government and to um, Montek Singh Alawalia here, are you sharing his overall uh, more bullish um, perspective, perspective on the, the global economic uh, a situation? Well, yes, I do share, to start with. And, and I want to come back uh, for consensus. It's very hard, it's very hard for tough decisions to have consensus anyhow. So, um, but um, I'm an optimist. Although they say that a, a, a pessimist is a well-informed optimist, well, I'm happy not to be too much informed. And, but, uh, but actually, if you see the title of this, uh, of this session here, it is from uh, Deliberation to Transformation, which is basically saying from from, from uh, words to action. And, and actually it is, in many respects, I feel India, specifically India is on crossroads. Um, and it is actually a, a coincidence, uh, maybe by chance or foresight, that we have the WEF talking on, on India just when government has taken, has reshuffled uh, quite, quite extensively uh, uh, the government in itself and also has taken uh, quite expressive actions and, and, and reforms that are quite explicit. And, and, and that is actually a, a, a base of optimism. You hear also saying, well, uh, we needed action and because growth was slowing down, 
we, we, we took too long to do what was, what was obvious to do, and that is a strong leadership. At the end of the day, to, to go through, through difficult times and all that, you need strong leadership. You need, you need to have an inspirational purpose creation uh, to all stakeholders, and I do see that happen, um, happening now. It is, uh, it is true that we also a little bit paranoid, and uh, when, when growth was 8 9%, everybody was saying it's going to overheat, um, now it is 5 6%, that's not good, it should be more, but now everybody says it's a drama. We should have a little bit more perspective on these things and give, give time to time without losing time. That's the problem. We may be losing time. We have heard over the, the last two days many, many uh, things that are quite obvious that has to happen in, in India. We know that. Uh, we spoke about infrastructures and, and going about that because that's the framing where you then can have economic activity flourish in a productive way. We spoke about uh, other dimensions like food security. We spoke about also this, this dimension of um, simplification. Uh, Overregulation is, is equal asphyxiation. And we know that these are the framings where you can have investment coming in, private investment, investment be it local, but also foreign investment. And we have heard now, again, uh, speak about this framing of having these uh, investments coming. Where my company is now, uh, this year we are 100 years in India. 100 years. Uh, so uh, speak about uh, commitment and, and trust. And we just inaugurated an R&D center, which is again helping to shape and be part of, of India. I, I two, two words, I would say, simplicity and continuity, consistency. That is uh, things, these are the framings that helps a country to really invite the economical activity to flourish and, and make it inclusive to, to a certain extent. Mr. Alovalia uh, was underlining also the importance of then increasing uh, the foreign direct investment, the investments in general in India, because that has been uh, reduced by 3% uh, the last couple of years and has not been increasing. Do you think the reforms that the government have put on the table now uh, they're sufficient to uh, then uh, break this negative trend? Are you impressed by the reforms? Are they uh, what it takes at this crossroad, as you were, was mentioning? Defining and exp making reforms explicit is one thing, um, but seeing traction of implementation, which is, again, action, is another thing, and I think that's the, that's the challenge. And one, once you see that coming, that there is really execution and discipline behind them, that's the environment where foreign investment comes. Investment comes when you see returns projected in the future. And that is linked with consistency again. And uh, I think, uh, well, all the, all the actions and all the decisions are there on the table. It's, it's for us to make it happen, or the government, together with other stakeholders, because it's not only government. It is also so that the negative noise, I feel, when you read also local press and all that, is, is always around, and, and there's so much more negative voices. Uh, that doesn't help uh, for the external proje uh, projection of, of what is India about, creates anxiety. And I feel press can do a good job here too, to create a little bit more, uh, shaping together that common purpose. If you see the potential, the, the, the cheer potential of this country, we can link it up with the world and all that, but intrinsically, this, this country has an amazing potential on its own. If you then also connect that with the outside world, it, it, it leverages that. But there's so much to be done here. And um, that's where private investment should come in to be part of that. Uh, Mrs. Jasmine uh, Witpred, um, you, you wanted the floor. Maybe you would also like to comment on uh, what um, is seen as one of the glo real global risks these days is the growing inequality. Even in a situation where we have had growth, we have seen also growing inequality. Yeah, I'll come to that. I just wanted to pick up on um, the point that uh, Montek Singh was making about, um, or actually that through your questioning that was being made around sort of really looking at the role of the US and looking to the US for leadership, for example, on the Doha round. Um, and we were talking earlier about actually, you know, there's a role for India there as well in terms of taking a leadership position with the, G, um, the G, G77. And that's one of the things I'm just thinking about the, the forum this, this year in India. Um, I was kind of surprised to see less appetite than one might imagine from the outside from India to really play a full leadership role in the world, whether it's with the G77 on trade or whether it's there was a session with India's uh, neighbors um, who were really looking to India to play a role, a, a leadership role in the region 
Also, all of the innovation that has just been said that, that goes on in India, actually, not just in the IT sector, but um, in the social sector as well, whether it comes to innovations for, for how to save newborn lives. There was just a session earlier um, with some of the, the, the leading thinking that's been published in The Lancet and recognized worldwide um, is now being taken on by the Planning Commission, I know, in India, but also in many countries around the world. So really just, just a reflection that I think, I, I know that there are concerns internally within India, and, and quite rightly, you're focusing on some of the challenges that you're facing um, in India, and that's all right and proper, but there is also an opportunity for India to play a role globally. Maybe we should ask Mr. Alovalia, will we see more of this kind of leadership uh, in G77, in G20, in BRIC uh, context from India's side? You know, I, I'm not, um, I mean, I'm not a diplomat, so I never know what... That's why it's uh, interesting what you answer. <laughs> yeah, my view is uh, India, should, India should play a constructive role. I think if we can lead ourselves, uh, that's good enough. The idea, the idea of us leading the G77, I'm not sure the G77 wants to be led by us, and I see no reason the, why we should be the only ones leading the G77. I think we need to be clear. We have, you know, as in every country, uh, I think uh, Mr. Huda made a very important point uh, towards the conclusion uh, of his uh, address. When he said that, coming out of the West at this point is a huge amount of questioning about the you know, effectiveness and fairness and this and that of the so-called liberal market economy. Uh, if you like, it's a kind of intellectual Voltfass which is uh, swamping developing countries uh, based on very narrow uh, perception. And incidentally, uh, it's largely propaganda in the sense that they're not changing their policies at all. They're doing exactly what they were doing, by and large. But it's put a whole lot of new things on the agenda that the market economy leads to inequality, this, that, and the other. I mean, we've always been sensitive to this. But what's happening now is that people are saying, well, you see, even the West is worried about it. Now, the fact of the matter is that any country at our level of income to persuade people that we need to integrate globally, uh, that is good for us, uh, that we will actually, as uh, Mr. Gopal Krishnan's sector best demonstrates, we can actually do very well in that world. It takes a lot of time. So frankly, most of our leadership capability, in my view, should be directed internally. And I think if we come out with an India which is speaking with a clear voice, the rest of the world will look after itself. We do have, we do have very strong interests uh, in, the, in the Doha round. And, um, you know, I think the, the way I, I would describe the Doha Round situation really as follows. After a lot of negotiation, uh, the differences between the industrialized countries and most of the developing countries had got narrowed down. And we were constantly being asked, that why can't you fellows be more flexible? And why are you taking, you know, you're at one end of the spectrum of, of the narrowed spectrum. Now, you know, when you, when you negotiate, that's exactly what happens. I mean, negotiators are tough guys. Uh, they're not softies who readily concede. What has derailed everything is that what was said to be the agreed narrowed spectrum has been taken off the table. And what, uh, we say, well, well, that agreement isn't there anymore. So the goalposts are changed. It's going to take a lot of... Uh, uh, it's possible that, you know, in a, in a global negotiation to take that view. Uh, I, don't, I don't deny that. But don't be surprised that uh, when, you, when negotiators come home uh, and they find that if you're changing the goalposts, you're, you're really reopening everything. That's not politically easy to handle. So the real issue is, uh, will, will the new leadership globally somehow be able to say, well, look, we must, we must be able to make progress. And, you know, how that's going to be done, whether it's going to be done in the, in the WTO, the, the full group of countries, the Quad, the smaller group of countries, G20. I mean, all of this now becomes really interesting. And the paradox is also that, uh, you know, in, when it comes to quantitative easing, stimulating the fiscal policy, all the, those measures are no use. So one of the areas where you can um, contribute to reviving economic growth is to 
agree on a global trade deal. Uh, and currently, uh, the global system is not able to do so. But uh, then turning to uh, Chris uh, Gopala Krishnan, Executive Co-Chairman of Infosys, when you're listening to Mr. Alawale, um, outlook on the economic situation, but also the reforms that uh, the current government now have introduced uh, in uh, India. Uh, is this uh, enough uh, to revive economic growth in this country? First of all, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was important to say that uh, we are back on track on reform. So uh, that is very much necessary and, and that is a very positive um, signal saying that we are back on track on reform. We want growth. It's been reiterated again and again. Is it enough? No, we have to follow through and make sure that the implementation happens. And we also have to follow through because we have to do a lot more. Uh, and, and it is actually in the agenda at this point. So we have to make sure that we follow through and look at some of the other uh, reforms that needs to follow. Uh, especially when it comes to infrastructure, things like land acquisition, um, you know, all the approval processes, etc. And we have to figure out what is the right mechanism. And, and this is what I believe, um, you know, very important. And it has come about in some of the discussions that have happened in the forum this time. Because uh, I think with a with lot more information available to people, uh, people, with a lot more power with people, a lot more voice to the people. How do we uh, do a negotiation which is supposed to be done? Negotiations are typically supposed to be done in private, actually. So it is actually a very interesting um, situation. I was just in a panel which has talked about internet and freedom of speech, actually. You know, we have to discuss this without emotions in order to actually come to uh, some narrow areas where we can agree on and maybe areas where we can disagree on and come to compromises, which is the art of negotiation. But then if it is just all emotions and taken to public forums before, we can actually finish the negotiation. <coughs> so that's, I think, that is what is happening to some extent in India with the challenges that we are faced with. But I'm glad that the process has started, uh, you know, the, the, and this is where leadership is also very, very important. Leadership has to create a positive story why maybe everybody has to give up something. I think that's what is, I think, positive for me at this point. Siddhartha Lal, uh, you're a young global leader, a very uh, successful, uh, also young businessman representing 400 million of young uh, people uh, uh, in this country. Listening to this discussion about uh, uh, reforms and the economic uh, situation in, in India and the opportunities that have to be created for the young people in this, uh, of this nation, um, what are your reflections? Well, um, I too, as was said earlier, I too am extremely optimistic about the future. There is uh, an enormous potential in the country and obviously we've discussed some of the areas which are holding us back and I think I'm going to use some of the things that I've heard over the last couple of days in trying to uh, in trying to say what that's coming around to so one of the things is that and I heard uh, Gita Gopinath saying that yesterday was that we see reform as this you know this monumental this moment that you know the, the, com the government is going through a reform phase it doesn't need to be like that it has to be on a daily basis it has to be on a regular basis I mean the the scale of reform the propensity and the, let's say, the, 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 the number of legislation which is going by has to be 10x, 20x. That's the type of speed of reform which is required to, to employ 100 million people, which is what the requirement is in the coming years. So um, to, to, to take care of the urban situation, which is what's happening, I mean, you're going to get 300 million more people in urban India in the next 20 years or so. So, so it is, we're dealing with a lot of scale here and we need to actually move forward in a, in a much, much, much faster fashion. But, I mean, uh, but having said that, I still think that, you know, there is, opt there is reason to be very optimistic about all of this because we've reached a point where I think um, from every angle, uh, there is nearly, a, a, you know, it's, it's like there's a force to 
to actually change. But I wish it wasn't required that there has to always be so much pressure that then the change comes through. It should, it should be a more natural process. And I think that's what I'm trying to grapple with in terms of why does it take so long. It's the same with the you know, corruption issue, which you know, we, we, we dealt with very well on this forum uh, yesterday as well. Um, I mean, it's taken you know, the entire public opinion and lots of discussion, and it's all out there, till, of course, then, of course, now some things are being done about it. So, which is good. I mean, things have to be done, and obviously, there's, a, there's progress ahead. But, yeah, that's, uh, but I think you know, it would be better if things would actually just move on much faster. Chave Rajavat, um, uh, Sarpanch of uh, Soda. Uh, listening to this discussion and also what was no just said about uh, corruption, you are really uh, working uh, in villages and, and working with, uh, with the people uh, of India. Is this with corruption and lack of governance? Is this something that is, uh, people are very conscious about? And uh, what are the reforms uh, that is needed in India seen from your vo viewpoint, more bottom up? Sure. Uh, of course, corruption, as we know, it, it's, it's a grappling issue. It's something that bothers each one of us to the very uh, bottom of the pyramid, to every individual um, across the strata in India. But um, uh, that, I believe, is not the only issue. There are very many, and of course, we do need reforms, uh, and very, again, many more as far as the grassroots level is concerned, because the larger population in India continues to live in uh, the rural sector, which has not really seen the development. And yes, our GDP has been, uh, well, it's, it's been fairly good. And there has, uh, however, the sad part is that it doesn't really, the trickle down effect to the last mile doesn't happen. And I think that needs to happen. And we need to work more towards ensuring that uh, there is a holistic development of our nation. And as Mr. Alvalia said, yes, we have lots to look into. We need to look inwards and uh, work uh, towards improving that and then Look out, but at the same time, I think what really has come across through this forum has been the fact that, um, as we all know, for any progress or any development, be it uh, for an individual, a community, or a nation, it is important to have partnerships and collaborations. And I think we need to uh, go ahead with those and, and work towards development. And of course, when I say that, I'm also going back to the sector that I'm from, from the rural sector. The only way forward for us in, in villages is to have that support system come forward to us, be it from the government or be it from the non-government sector. And I'm hoping we'll be able to take that forward. What I really appreciate is the fact that we've been, when I say we, I'm talking about the villages of India, are getting a platform over here to speak about our, our issues, and I'm hoping we will be heard and uh, things will improve for us. Mr. Alovalia, we, we have spoken a lot about economic reforms and economic um, global uh, situation and, and prospects. If you're looking at uh, reforms in a broad context uh, for India, education, infrastructure, inclusive growth, and etc., could you share with us uh, some of your views on what is needed of reforms in those sectors and where you would like to see your country uh, based on this in 10 years? You know, we, <clears throat> we've just finished uh, the 12th five-year plan, which is uh, just under a thousand pages. So if, if I start giving you a comprehensive account, I mean, those things lay out a huge roadmap. But you know, look, we have a very long way to go. Uh, and every one of the areas that you mentioned uh, pose specific challenges. Some of, them, some of these challenges are dominantly financial. Some of them are largely technological. Many of them are really social, institutional, delivery issues, which are quite complex. So I, one of the things I think we should recognize is that you know, uh, reforms are not the kind of thing where if you some, somebody were to sign a, a, an order, that would get done. I mean, we're, very often we're trying to create institutions that are going to work. Very often, we're trying to empower institutions that already exist, like you know, the third level of democracy, that there, it's in the Constitution, hasn't got empowered. Uh, so frankly, it's a huge agenda. Uh, all I can say is that I think a lot is happening. And I think if you were to, if you were to judge by, by any aggregate metric, uh, things in the last 10 years, these are the years of rapid growth, uh, things have come out better than they did in the previous 10 years. And that's not just growth. 
That's even true of things like how much reduction of poverty, what happened to infant mortality rates, this, that, and the other. The difference, however, is that we're now, firstly, we're much more concerned. I mean, 20 years ago, you didn't have NGOs going out there, subjecting what was going on to the sort of, uh, if you like, scrutiny and standards that you would actually expect from an urban environment. So nobody bothered very much. That's happening today. I mean, you declare the right to education as an act, which we've done. Immediately, people ask the question that is the quality of education provided everywhere the same? And it's, to do that will take 30 years, not just passing an act. So I think what's happening is that a participative democracy, which is giving a voice to people, combined with a very free press, is actually holding up a mirror to our face in every different dimension. To, 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 to say that at the end of it, therefore, what comes out naturally uh, is that a lot of uh, shortcomings hides the fact that there's also a lot of progress going on. And I personally feel that uh, in any one of these areas, if you ask the question, are there positive stories? Uh, are a lot of good things happening? Uh, I think you'll find that there are a really lot of positive stories. But I don't think that at the moment they're aggregating to a movement. So the real question is, in the next 10 years, is the system going to learn from these positive stories and sort of create an institutional mechanism that will make more of them happen? Or will they be stamped out and will, uh, will only be supporting the failures? I don't think we'll be doing that. So if you, if you look at it from that perspective, uh, we need lots and lots of things. And I would say, by the way, that uh, almost two-thirds of what needs to be done is now in the hands of state governments, not the central government. And differences across states are really enormous. Uh, virtually any statement about India in terms of aggregate performance and all these things hides the fact that the variation across states is enormous. Now, this has an important implication. I mean, if you find that in three or four states of India, whatever, total fertility rate has really collapsed, uh, this is going to feed back into the rest of the system because th this is all part of India where it's happening. You know, making international comparisons never really has the same effect as being able to say, well, look, if, the, if it can be done here, why can't it be done somewhere else? I expect to see that uh, in the next 10 years. Jasmine Vitprad, you wanted a short comment? Well, I just wanted to come back to the question you asked me earlier on inequality, but also I'm, I'm glad I'm doing so now because you've touched on, on some of these issues, those wider reform um, issues that, uh, you know, you're talking about like child mortality, for example, and the kind of health, um, universal health for, for all and some of the reforms that are being brought in there. I mean, I think my reflection on, on this forum is that there, there does seem to be increased recognition of these, um, you could call them social issues, but actually they're also the underlying drivers of the potential transformation of India. Um, you know, drivers such as the very low value that is placed on the lives of girls and women, witnessed by the uh, sex ratio that was talked about in an earlier plenary and the low percentage of women in the workplace, and drivers such as, you know, the fact that nearly half of all Indian children are malnourished, which means they risk growing up stunted, either mentally or physically. And, and, I, and I, so that on the positive side, I do see that that is being increasingly recognized, both by the government and by conversations and, and collaboration in, in fora like this. On the downside, I, I think that there still isn't sufficient will to really tackle them. And it's a little bit, um, as, as Sid was saying, it's, it feels like you have to build up a tremendous head of steam before any of these issues really get tackled. Um, and, and it seems a shame because actually everybody agrees they need to be tackled, so can't we get on and do it now? Do you want to comment, uh, sir? No, no, I agree. It's not uh, really just I, for government, no. but... Me or...? Yeah, Mr. Aluvalia, yeah, for example. Okay. No, no, I, <laughs> I, I agree that the, uh, there is, I think, an awareness uh, that these are important issues. Uh, and, you know, I believe uh, progress is taking place. Uh, uh, you mentioned half of all children being malnourished. You're kind of rounding it up from 40%, actually. 40% is a huge number. But uh, the second, no, because I think uh, some interesting issue here. Uh, 
The only officially known number on child malnourishment comes from 2005, data. 2006. Yes, you've got all data. This is our fault. I mean, we don't measure the damn thing every year. We should. It's the most important single indicator. But as a result, I mean, uh, the 11th plan started in the year 2007, 2008, and said, look, this child malnourishment thing is a disgrace, which it is. All I'm saying is we have no idea at the moment what has been the impact of these programs. I don't think it's gone down massively, but I have no doubt whatsoever yeah, that there is more progress than there was in the previous 10 years. But I would not be surprised at all if we still have whatever, 33%, and that is unacceptable. I mean, in the sense that it's very difficult to take it below 15%. But, you know, going from 33 to 15, that's the, that's the objective. And it's something that should be done in 10 years. There's no question, in my view. If, if I may just add to that, I think, um, as Mr. Alivalia said, there, there is stuff happening. We have social entrepreneurs who we got to see doing this uh, forum as well. Uh, it is, of course, the responsibility of the government, but the, but because the issues are so vast and so huge, we do grapple with how to figure those things out, how to work around it. But even when it comes to providing the very basic amenities, drinking water, shelter, food security, security for women and the girl child, etc., we want to work, the government wants to work, it is making an attempt, but the numbers are so large. And that is where I feel the private sector needs to come in. We need more social entrepreneurs, and I think we need to give them more space and a platform to come up with various ideas and help. And, and I think PPP models could perhaps be the best way forward for India, given the large scope and the vast expanse and diversity that we have in our nation. And I think that's something that we need to be open to and work forward towards. Mr. Bilke, and we're coming uh, close to the end. But uh, just, ju ju just one comment, um, and, and it has been mentioned. Uh, the, the issues are so huge, and, and it is indeed, uh, and you spoke about 1,000 pages of, 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 of program, and, and, and somewhere uh, you have then to simplify, and because you spoke about the journey, this is a journey, but I speak about consistency, I spoke about that before. And sometimes you feel with all these issues, and malnutrition is definitely one of the major, major problems you have because the productivity of the whole country depends on it, and, 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 and so many resources are going dragged into it if you don't tackle it now. Uh, but also, sometimes you feel the government has to, has to do all that work. And I, I, I believe there is somewhere a, a leveraging of a government framing and having consistent policies, but then let also the, the, the private sector play a role, frame it well, but the private sector, when it <coughs> plays into a very framed uh, direction, can create so much wealth. Industrialization is definitely another <coughs> point where I feel that can absorb so much wealth creation, and that is very much more capillary and goes much more deeper into the society than, I, I, I may remember that uh, there was a, a saying that say, well, for India, we want computer chips, not potato chips. Well, uh, and. You need computer chips, but potato chips was industrialization. And that is something that I feel can do so much wealth and, and create so much many jobs that you then, also with the rural areas, to absorb part of the rural areas that are now stuck into agriculture in a in not very efficient way. And how uh, the attraction of foreign uh, direct investment in the food manufacturing can help there too. Because, uh, as I said, we have been for 100 years here, but how we can, uh, in the MOGA, uh, in MOGA, we are linked up with 100,000 farmers who bring to one factory their milk and how we have been developing that together. So there is a, cross, a crossing of, of a private sector, what is called sometimes self-interest, but also we call that creating shared value. That is, that an, an, an economical activity of, of companies should, when it is framed in the long term and with a set of values, should, yes, create success for the company, but also create a success and value for society at large. And that's somewhere also a an expression of trust that the private sector can be definitely a very, very important part of that creation and that equation. So, uh, since we're now uh, coming to the close, I'll leave one minute to each of the, of the coaches, uh, if you want uh, to share with us for one minute, uh, any thoughts at the end or main outcome that you felt uh, um, you're bringing with you uh, after these days uh, at uh, our summit. So let me then start with uh, Chris, Kupala Krishnan, you also asked for the floor, so that was sure. good timing. Yeah, see, I strongly believe that um, just one model is not um, 
sufficient given the size and the scale of the problem. We need to try out different models and um, uh, different ways of doing things. Second is that um, in a democracy, government has an important role to play. Uh, politicians and politics has an important role to play. We need to not look at it as versus them, but we need to look at it as how can we all work together to make this happen? How can we build partnerships and collaboration? I think somebody talked about it to make this happen. Um, you know, I, I you know I, I believe in private sector, but I also believe that there is a role for civil society. There is a role for uh, government. There is a role for academia research, innovation, and we need to work all together to make this happen. And what I feel is that, you know, there is an opportunity for India also to create new models um, in, in areas like sustainable consumption, sustainable development, etc., some of which got discussed in this forum, uh, which I think we can contribute back to um, the, the, the world. Because the disparity is one of the challenges which every country, every system is now faced with. You know, though uh, Mondek Singh talked about, you know, is coming from West, but I feel it has happened in every society. So we need to think about that also and see what what we can do because we are feeling it strongly in India also. Siddhartha. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, on the one hand, of course, business needs to shape up as well. I mean. Uh, it's not only about the government. I mean, I think today in India, it's like the Wild West, you know, in business because everyone's just out there doing what they want. It's, and, and also, I mean, you know, I'm saying from a transparency and from a corruption point of view, you know, there are two, two hands, there are two sides of the coin. And, and so business has a Im very important role to play. Having said that, it's still an outstanding place to invest, India. So countries, uh, companies such as Nestle, who've been here for so long, and people who make meaningful long-term investments, Today, they are the ones who are going to prosper 10, 20, 30 years from now when India to totally flourishes. So there is enormous opportunity as it stands today. But if I were to say that what is the one big thing that I took out after these two days of a really good multi-stakeholder event, you know, which is what it truly was, um, was the issue about transparency. And I think it was great to have Mr. Vinod Rai here who, who actually spoke about it very eloquently and was, and I think, the, the point which came out was that transparency will really foster meritocracy. Whether it's in politics or in business or in civil society, it fosters meritocracy. And it liberates the force of true entrepreneurship in India. And that is the strength of India, entrepreneurship. And if we can liberate that force of entrepreneurship, everything will be set right in my opinion. So, so really that's my two bits from, from the last couple of days. Thank you. So, uh, then we have Jasmine Wittbrett. In a word, collaboration. I think uh, collaborative partnerships are going to be absolutely important going forward. I was kind of surprised at how the level of kind of mutual suspicion between business and civil society in particular here in India is stronger than I've seen in other parts of the world. And I think that these kind of fora where, that provide opportunities for, um, for discussion, honest debate, uh, can only help. And I'm certainly going away with lots of opportunities for collaboration between my organization and business. And I just hope that, that there's more of those and that we can work together on a, on a larger scale at the macro level as well in order to tackle some of these issues that we all care about. Thank you so much. Achave uh, Rajavat. Um, I think this forum has been uh, really great for me. One, for providing uh, the platform to a Sarpanch, uh, the elected head of a village council, which usually does not happen. And uh, I'm, I'm glad, as um, uh, we just heard, it's, it's important that people from the different sectors of the society come together and try and work together towards improving the nation and, of course, get support from outside as well as in where it can come through. So I think it's really great, and I really uh, love the fact that we are discussing different um, uh, aspects of, of development from economic to, to softer issues of women and children 
etc. Because if you're looking at development, it has to be the, a holistic development. It has to be holistic in the sense of different sectors, be it the urban sector or the rural sector. It's only then can, can we actually develop and improve uh, in a big way. What I would like to appeal is, given the fact that there's so much technology, there's so many innovations that are going on, um, I'd plead to all of you to come forward and help us in rural India, because I think technology is one of the biggest ways of uh, bridging the gap that exists, be it in terms of education, be it in terms of um, providing uh, livelihoods, improving them through uh, vocational training, etc. Because, of course, the costs involved, as we know, and um, also the willingness of people to go to villages, unfortunately, is, is not enough. And that's where I think technology can play a huge role. And I'm uh, certain, in fact, I have already uh, met some people, and I've really appreciated the warmth and the appreciation they've shown towards me and my work. And uh, some of them have even tried to understand what kind of issues exist at the grassroots level in the villages. And uh, it's, it's been really motivating um, and touching for me to see that there are people out here who've shown willingness to come forward. And I'd like to invite all of you to come to my village and see how much development we've been able to do and what all is there. There's so much more to do, not just in my village, but I think with all your support, villages across the country can um, get the support and improve in a big way. And I'd like to thank all of you for the appreciation you have shown towards me and my work. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, Paul Bulka. Uh, very fast. I was uh, yesterday on a panel, and it uh, was about Reboot India. I don't believe we have to re It was a very lively discussion. Um, <laughs> I remember that. Well, most of the um, discussions there are was very, a, very was a very. I, no, I must say I learned a lot about India uh, in that panel. Um, <laughs> and maybe some reason why sometimes it goes a little bit slower than it should. Um, the title is uh, uh, Deliberation Transformation from Words. We had the words there, we have to go to action. But anyhow, I, I do believe, uh, as I said, we, uh, India, it feels like if you listen and hear, India is on the crossroads, it's always interesting. And I do believe they have taken decisions that are uh, quite inspirational. These are good platforms to work on. But I, w I would really invite them to be consistent uh, and have the higher purpose of this country really dictating uh, that purpose, rather than the infighting and all that, that is so the negative for the country per se. So I, I said also simplicity. Uh, simple things are normally better understood by the broader uh, public, and uh, so simplicity and consistency and the potential of this country is just amazing. Montek uh, Singh Alovale, you know, listen to um, the main takeaways uh, from these two days from our distinguished uh, co-chairs. And as I mentioned also in uh, the introduction, uh, to you, uh, you being a very, very central person behind uh, the reforms in India in the 90s, but also the reforms that are being undertaken now. You're in charge together with the Prime Minister for the five years plan and also spend considerable time of your life at IMF. But looking at India in a broader global uh, context, India has achieved a lot. But looking at the decade to come, and uh, you're now embarking on a new five years plan, and then there will be a new one probably after that one. Where do you realistically see India in 10 years? And where are your aspirations uh, for <laughs> India? <laughs> well, look, um, you know, if you, if you just look at uh, conventional measures, GDP and so forth, uh, the most that you can do in 10 years is actually to double per capita GDP. I mean, you need to grow at about 7% per capita to double per capita GDP. So, uh, I mean, that's not going to make us a very rich country in terms of per capita income. But I think if it's, uh, if it's an inclusive growth, and if we address some of the issues that have been raised by various participants, which are very much on the agenda, I can assure you that no government in India can be conducting or designing policy not aware of the need to do the inclusion, to take care of uh, the obvious deficiencies on the social side, make sure that the rural sector improves, etc. I think over 10 years, we could make a very substantial difference in many of these indicators. So, you know, the level of poverty 10 years from now will be quite different. Uh, we never eliminate it, but it will be much lower than what it is now. And, and the important thing then is, you know, that uh, like 30 years ago, or, yeah, 30 years ago, uh, you would have had 70% of the people below the poverty line. And 10 years from now, it may be only down to less than 20%. 
uh, that alters the sort of perspectives of people, what kind of aspirations people have, uh, you know, younger, younger population. I think that's going to bring about huge changes that you really can't plan for, but you should keep your mind open on, because I do agree, new ways of doing things, innovation, and in, in India, that's unavoidable. I mean, it's impossible, and I'm glad it's impossible, to plan from top down. Uh, so I think we're going to have lots and uh, lots of experimentation. And my guess is that, you know, since in all these critical areas, uh, they really lie in the hands of state governments, uh, states are actually competing against each other. So I'm pretty sure that most, I hope, will do extremely well. I hope that all of them do well. In due course, all of them will do well. Okay. Thank you. I think that uh, merits uh, applause. I would like, uh, of course, on behalf of all the participants, to, to thank, uh, especially, uh, of course, uh, Montek Singh Alavalia, that you spent uh, your precious time with us here this afternoon. But I also would like, of course, uh, to uh, then convey a heartfelt thank to our distinguished coaches that have been with us and shown their leadership for two days. I would also like to thank all our participants and I hope that uh, you have had a rewarding days here. I think uh, we've all seen that it is uh, India that is again uh, undertaking important reforms. It is an India that is no, not looking and being satisfied and complacent with the economic growth of 5.5%, but looking at how to get back to 7 8%, and then also being able to deal uh, with all the challenges in this um, country, but also all the opportunities, and giving all the young people of this nation more than 50% under 25 years, the opportunities that they are also longing for. I would also like to use this opportunity uh, to thank uh, my uh, two very good uh, colleagues, uh, Sushant Palakarti Rao, he's uh, Senior Director for Asia. He's uh, been uh, one of the masterminds behind this, and also my colleague Virash Mehta, uh, our uh, India Director. Very uh, thankful for their effort, and I, again, Thank you to all, and uh, this is the closing of the 28th World Economic Forum Summit on India. Thank you. Thank you.